Gary Beaton. Man, here we are in Moravian <laughs> Falls. Awesome. And uh, we want to talk about a lot of things, Gary, but I just appreciate you coming oh, on and, and being Thank with you us. so much, yeah. Um, a lot of things we could talk about tonight. Um, we could start last year mm-hmm. with some things that happened because we hadn't seen each other, was it four years, I think? Yeah, probably four years, yeah. And I, I consider you to be a very unusual prophet. You, you're like a times and seasons mm-hmm. kind of prophetic guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's my um, initially just looking at how you, how you flow. And mm-hmm. at least in, in my own life, I've, I've had these things where you've kind of come for a season. Right. And then you like, where's Gary? I couldn't find you. <laughs> right. And then you pop back on the scene. Right. But I told you before we started, I, I, I wanna I wanna start with the situation that happened with the clock at Bob's um in in the in the um hospital. Yeah. And um I wanna start there. Okay. And then let's just see where things go. Okay. So so the clock. The clock. Now, there's a video of this on YouTube for people to watch. Yeah. But I want you to just to explain that. Wow. We'll just go there. Okay. It was fantastic. Um, you know, the last few weeks of Bob's life, you know, uh, I can remember in December uh, just being together. There was no hint of anything. You know, here he passes on February 14th, but it's the middle of December and everything's great. Just, mm. There's no clue. He's on dialysis. Couple but he's times, doing pretty couple, good. Oh, man. He was doing great. At that time, really had no no comprehension. So, I mean, it, it all, it really, what I'm saying is it actually really kind of happened fast when it was time. And I believe, you know, there's a lot of prophets that have gone early. That's mm-hmm. been what's shaken, I think, you know. But Bob, I think it was time, you know. He could have lived longer, but his life was extended. He coded in 2007. It's an amazing story that he literally was in the hospital from some kidney test, and he coded in the hospital. I mean, he he died. Wow. And he came back. It was just a phenomenal story. So he had an extension from for seven more years, really, I think. So that night, um, in early February, he's in the hospital. He's not doing well. You know, they know, they kind of know he only has so much time. So on February 6th, the Thursday night, um, it, it, there were just a number of, of just, you could tell um, in his room, there was so much supernatural activity. You know, it was, yeah. it was just the, the angelic realm was stirred up. There was just uh, Bob, you know, it's, it's amazing. We're all in what felt in these encounters that he's still praying mm-hmm. i mean he's still uh he's still in the midst of it's not time for me to go yet and i'm engaged and i'm not going to go until i need to go although there's a struggle in his body shutting down sort of you know okay with the whole kidney shut down and everything but he was still a- active engaged awake so on thursday night february 6th um you know at It was almost midnight. So Bonnie's there, her two kids, Lynn and Kim, and I were in the room together. And so we realized at 11.55, the clock, the minute hand on the clock starts spinning fast. The minute hand starts going round and round. And what time is this again? It's like 11.55 at night. So 11.55, five minutes till 12. Five minutes till 12 that night now you got to know this the, the hospital it's it's not run on a system of like atomic clocks this is just a clock plugged into a wall like a, a circular clock you'd see in your elementary school right or whatever right. every room's the same it's not on a system where all the clocks sync at a certain time i've heard that so much i get that response yeah. all the time yeah on that youtube on my channel um, and Bonnie has it on hers, but you know we've heard that so much. Oh, it has to be an atomic clock. No, it wasn't. 
My. You know? Yeah, because they just are sure this cannot be supernatural. And My. it was absolutely supernatural. Yeah. So the second hand, or the, the, mid, mid, uh, the minute hand, begins to spin round and round, fast, accelerated. And we're watching it go round and round. It goes, it goes 12 hours and 5 minutes. I mean, we're watching it go round and round and round. And, and literally, it goes from at 11.55, the whole thing starts spinning. And it gets around like a dozen hour. And now it's now 1 o'clock. And it's going around again. It's 2 o'clock. It's going around again. It's 3 o'clock. By the time I get... We're watching this. It's happening so fast in five minutes. i got to get my camera going. Right. So I start my camera about 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, um, you know it's... it's uh, I don't know. It's a couple minutes into the five minutes that I... Lock my camera in. It's 5 a.m. So by the time you did the video, it had already been spinning. It had already been spinning from midnight to 5 a.m. So we're almost halfway through what's happening. But I capture it live, starting about 5 a.m. You can see this footage. Yeah. And um, what's fascinating, so I'm we're watching this supernatural event live, capturing it on a camera like, I can't believe this is even happening. You know, it's like... You don't even grasp like what what's happening, but you want you know this is supernatural. Yes, you know God's speaking. You want to capture it at least in the moment because you don't even know what's going to happen next. You don't know what's going to happen, so you're watching, and it gets from five. It continues to spin six, seven, and about seven fifty. It slows down. The minute hand slows down at seven fifty, coming up on eight. And it stops at 8 p.m. for about 10 seconds. It's like, what's it doing stopping at 8? Mm. And then it starts again. It vividly stops at 8. Right at 8 o'clock. Right at 8 o'clock, exactly. At 8 o'clock. And, and then like, it starts again. And starts again about 10 seconds later. And it, you know, it begins to spin again as fast as it was before, but very methodical. So it's coming up past 9, past 10 past 11 and it gets slowing down again and it comes up to midnight and stops and sinks exactly at midnight in the five minutes it goes to five minutes it had been spinning 12 hours and five minutes and at the precise time it was supposed to be midnight it sinks up at midnight whoa on our on our on our phones it's midnight and it had done the whole thing precisely and syncs up exactly at what was midnight. Whoa. Whoa, it's right. 12 hours and 5 minutes. And then it comes to 12 again. So there's a couple 12s. I mean, it's just fascinating. Just fascinating. And, um... Did you feel like that was angelic? What, what was your sense when that happened? Yeah, absolutely. I feel it was angelic. It was the hand of God. I mean... And we're watching it being a clock, mm -hmm. but I believe is actually time. You know, if God's had me, you talked about times and seasons, but that's been the pattern of my prophetic life. It's always been uh, somehow the eternal realms, kairos, of eternity, you know, there is no time. Uh, and, and yet it's God's divine moments in our lives, the kairos, what he plans and determines to do, his set times and laws, his seasons for us, that he sinks up and we enter a Kairos moment that he My. always meant to happen. My. To meet someone, for an event to happen. And here we are, we walk right into a Kairos moment and the wind's on it. You know, takes your breath away. Yeah. Different times in our lives where we know there's significant. Uh, times it's a hand of God that, that just enters in. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's angels. He employs the angels to do these things. So we're watching it kind of in one dimension 2d on a clock right you know right it just seemed very flat but what's really happening stepping back from it all looking at the eternal realm what's he saying in our chronos time what's he saying in our earth time connecting with kairos eternal time mm. what's what is he saying and why is he doing this so man that was the first time that was the first time it happened. It happened a week later, the Thursday night, 
before he dies on Friday Wait morning. Wait a minute. So I thought it was only I thought it was literally only one time that this happened, but it happened again? No, it happened again the night he My passed. My goodness. Yes, it's it's two. It's the two. It happens the next Thursday night. Now this again, it's not an atomic clock. That next Thursday night, it happens again. And at 11.55, the next Thursday night, February 13th, at 11.55, it does the same exact pattern. Wow. Again. Again. It's dramatic. Man. Um, so, I mean, that's stunning. And, you know, it's amazing because, I mean, there's so much to it, but it's the two. When, you, you know, when Joseph spoke to Pharaoh and he said, the two dreams are one and the same. Mm. And he said, it means that it's from God and it's going to happen quickly. You know, that was the meaning yeah. of the, you know, the interpretation of the dream, what needs to be stored up and all of that, you know, the plan. So, uh, uh, what's storing up for the famine. Yeah. So it's that too. God always gives that witness. It's a witness. Uh, that's what really confirms this whole thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a one time. If it was, that's enough for me. Right, right. It's totally enough. But it was fascinating to just try to take in the perspective. So it happened, and you've got a few days to kind of take this in. But the mm -hmm. second time it happens, um, uh, that's what really just confirmed it all wow. the first time we were able to capture it the second time i mean we were all in the room then but an ice storm had hit charlotte that like tuesday, on the 13th or yeah, tuesday yeah tuesday a couple days before that and it made it so i couldn't get to the hospital i mean that week he's gonna really pass we had said our goodbyes uh -huh. i mean we had this really gripping conversation knowing he's gonna pass mm. any day we had this deathbed time uh, that just, you know, I mean, there's nothing more touching or emotional than to know your really good friend, you know, whatever, in any of our lives, what, whatever, uh, a parent, a grandparent, someone very close, and you know you're close, and it's a time you know is going to pass, and you have these moments. Right. And I had was able to have those with Bob to be able to have these last words together. Man. So that was so precious. So even though I couldn't be there and get into the hospital because of the ice storm, um, but everything was shut down. Charlotte shut down, the airport, everything shut down. So Bonnie's at the hospital alone. And and really, the there was just one security guy getting doctors in and out with a four-wheel drive and nurses to try to keep the hospital going. So the hospital's locked down and is frozen. Okay. Bonnie's there for the last few days and the last night. So she saw it happen again. My. So this was fascinating. And, you know, just in the end of it, I, I just believe the Lord's speaking about acceleration. With the passing of Bob Jones, that leading up to that, so many different events, that this was in the timing of God this major prophet, right? you know, for almost a century, is passing. And heavens, I mean, it's like a standing up. It's absolutely this honor yeah. that this prophet is passing. And time is passing. And it is a major Kairos moment in the Kronos moment. Right. Together, watching the passing of a prophet. Mm -hmm. So, and I believe the clock is just... You know, as simply as you can, it's just God speaking about the acceleration that in that moment, I believe there was a signal that that the church, in effect, was behind, that we could be behind in where we need to be in preparation, so to speak. And only God knows where it all needs to be. Yeah. But I believe in that passing and in that moment, God was literally moving uh, and adjusting and syncing something up hmm. that, um, you know, syncing the church up to be on time. I believe it was that that strong. So you felt that, that, that something happened in the Spirit. Absolutely. Something happened in the Spirit 
to absolutely be a message to the church in the passing of Bob Jones mm -hmm. about the movement of time mm -hmm. and the passing of it in those five minutes. Twelve is divine government. Right. And that it's speaking about the last day church. And, um, you know, that God is releasing the government of God on time in the last days yeah. with Bob's passing. And we're not going to miss it. We're not going to miss it. We can't miss it. He won't let us miss it. Wow. He won't let it, us miss it. You know, when it comes to our destinies, he wants more for us to reach what we need to reach even more than we do. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he's determined if we've got a heart to be engaged, that he will not let us miss it. Mm. You know what's interesting about men, in, men of God in general, and I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, particularly about Bob, is that when Bob was with us, I don't really think that we knew what what we had and who he was. And I think a lot of times when men of God leave and go to heaven, we realize, man, this was, this was somebody that God had sent. You, you, you follow me on that? Absolutely. And now that Bob is, 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 is in heaven, so many more stories have come forward about what, what is tr you know, people that he's touched, you know, right down through the line. Yeah. You know. Now, and you received a raw a, a shepherd's rod from from Bob. What month was that? Was that in January? No, that was in December. Okay. That was in December. It was on 12/12. It was on 12/12/13 that he gave it to me. Now it's a year before. Passed. Well, oh, no. He passed in 14, so wow. it's literally So that's literally months before. Yeah, that would have been his a, last shepherd's rod he would have given. Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was that close, and that's what I was referring to, a time when everything was still fine. It was beautiful. It was amazing. My. You're right. He, I mean, he foretold of comets. He foretold these massive major events, Toronto, 10 years before. Yeah. You know, he, he prophesied and predicted so many ma massive prophetic events in the, in the church that would ign actually ignite whole movements, the prayer movement around yeah. the world. I mean, all these things that, uh, and really Paul Cain, John Paul, all of them were, had major contributions for what's ahead that would help prepare us for the stadiums. Bob spoke of the open fields where millions would gather, you know, the woodstocks of the future. Yeah. So there were similar things in pattern it's fascinating the the passing of those three even in five years you know just stunning mm. the timing of those three major right, prophets right. all and in then, the same month yeah yeah they all what's interesting is they pass in late february each of them in their respective years john uh paul uh, bob in 2014 john paul february 18th he dies in 15 mm -hmm. and paul cain this year yeah and so, you know, it's remarkable, and no one, people had picked up on it, uh, that Bob, you know, was buried, they had to wait a week to try to make sure every, enough people could fly in uh, to Morningstar for the memorial service and the burial. And uh, so he was buried on 222. Yeah. And then here, John Paul, a year later, uh, dies on the 18th, February 18th. Four days later, he's buried on 222. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Cain this year is buried on 222. Yeah. Just as a marker. And what's fascinating, Charlie, is that in studying the Reformation and the early church and Luther, is the same pattern took place in his own life. That Luther died on February 18th, 1546, and was buried on 222. That's incredible. It just, yeah, it's stunning. This marker, this arc through time. I think that's the prophetic message, mm -hmm. is that there's this kind of arc through time, and three. He was a seed going into the ground, launching the Reformation. Yeah, and then this arc of time, five hundred years later, five hundred and one years later, uh -huh. with Paul Cain, with the three seeds going into the ground, right, speaks of 
this coming harvest, My. this new reforming, mm. this new harvest beyond words. Man. I think it's such a signal of the moment we're in right yeah. now. Yeah. Absolutely. Words and synchronization. It's such a massive signal. Now, could you... I want to take you back to um, Bob's when he when his funeral mm-hmm. and the um, the actual service. Mm-hmm. Did you what was that like for you? Because because Rick came and asked you to get up and and speak for a moment, and you'd known Bob for a while. You had taken care of him, but he was like a friend to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, what was what was that like? That moment. Wow, you know. Um, Bonnie had asked if I would be one of the speakers, you know. Rick was one, Mike Bickle, Uh Paul Keith Davis, guys that were so close to Bob for 20-some years, more than that. So for me to be asked and Rick call me up, um, I mean, it was such an incredible honor, just the honor of it. Yeah. Because he really, in my life, was like a a dad. He was a father to me. Mm. But really... The way I felt it was, we were like best, you know, he was one of my best friends. Yeah. You know, and that was the sweetest thing, is that he, we had these special moments together and caring for him. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a place, it's funny, I had made some notes, you know what it's like to make notes, and you think you're going to kind of go with these notes, (laughs) and you get there, and you just fold it up. Because there's, forget it, yeah, you know, yeah. forget going with some notes. Because you're in the moment. And the place is packed with thousands of people. The balconies of that, of heritage, the atrium, the balconies are filled with people standing and sitting. My. And Bob's in his casket below. It's this profound moment. Literally every level, like four levels, four stories. The place is just standing room only. And it's holy. That's all I could get is we're in this holy, holy time. What was in my heart, you know, everyone wanted to share stories about Bob. You know, Mm -hmm. it's just to honor him. That's the whole point. Yeah. It's just honoring Bob's life, what he did, what he contributed as a dad, as a father in the faith to all of us. Um, What was in my heart was a shepherd's heart was just... The hurting, just, you know, the church, the prophetic church, the the pain of seeing him pass. Like uh-huh. Bob was such the prophet of love. Everyone wanted to touch him or be around him and to be near him. And he's just impacted every one of our lives. Yeah. Everyone's. So he was a fixture, like family to all of us. Mm. And it's like we all had the same heartbeat in this moment. We, we are all connected in this moment of of love, you know, and and the tragedy of his passing, it was yeah. it was really a broken heart, and so I don't know, the things I shared I don't know how long uh, I shared, but I wanted to speak about just his life and the impact of his love, and speak as a father, speak as a pastor, as a shepherd, yeah, to just bring comfort. That yeah. was my role. Yeah, it was such a powerful moment when you stretched forth the rod, and that was, that was incredible. That was incredible. I'll never forget that. It, it was, it was something. And, um, but, again, we hadn't seen each other, <laughs> in in uh, four years, I think. Mm-hmm. And then, um, last year we were doing an event here, mm-hmm. and and the Lord led you here. To come to the event. I mean, you didn't even know what event was coming. You just came to Moravian Falls. I had come to see Anna Roundtree. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, Saturday morning, May 26th, last year, 18. And the Lord, you know, we, I had talked with Anna, and it was just a, a time I wanted to see her. And uh, we'd known each other for a long time. But it was that particular Saturday that was a good time. She, she, you know, wasn't having prayer meetings any particular time of the week. She mostly spent her time writing every day. So weekdays weren't real good, but Saturdays were good. So we agreed I'd come on that Saturday morning, the 26th. So at 10 in the morning, uh, 
I'm in Moravian Falls, or I'm in Wilkesboro. And before I get to her house, the Lord says, get a room for the night. He just says it to me real clear. Get a room for the night. You're going to be staying right mm -hmm. here. I want mm -hmm. you right here. So I call, and there's only two places with rooms. It's the Holiday Inn Express, this, this conference center, and Red Carpet Inn. And Lord says, stay at the Holiday Inn. So at 10 a.m., I book a room here at this place. My. And I have no clue there's a conference going on with Jeff Jansen and Charlie Champ right. and Kevin Pasconi right. in this place, in the hotel there. I had no clue. So I go see Anna. God plans this whole thing. Uh, I go see Anna. We spend hours and hours together. It's fantastic. My. It's such a joy uh, to spend time with her. She had been, she and Albert had been such good friends of Bob, even back in Kansas City days. Mm -hmm. So they had a long history. So um, it's just awesome to be with her. Well, I come down the mountain, and I come to the hotel about 2 o'clock or whatever. I get out of the car, and uh, there are people I know sitting outside the hotel on a bench from Rochester. What are you doing here? You know, it happens in our lives. Wherever we go, you know, traveling, ministering, right. we run into people. Right, you know? right. And, and just... this is, and, and you're not expecting to see these people and what's going on here. And... Right. Yeah, I was just stunned. I mean, I got out of, out of the Jeep and I came around and we're hugging each other. I'm like, what are you doing here? Yeah. And all of a sudden they tell me there's a conference. And I had no clue. God had just arranged it. Yeah. He sovereignly wanted me to show up unexpectedly. Where were you living at that time? Were you in Tennessee or? No, I had moved here, not far from Raven oh, Falls. Oh, so you had already you had already made yeah, the transition already, yeah. over here. And you, did you feel like the Lord had called has been calling you over to this area? Absolutely. I I'd lived in Tennessee for twenty five years. Yeah. You know, in Maryville, and I don't know. It had been about three years ago. I knew for years. Bob always said I would live here. Mm -hmm. He said I'd live here. I'd come in and out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew it for at least 12 years. Yeah. At some point, I, you know, you want to do it when God wants. I feel like God's doing something fresh here, too. Yeah. You can feel it in the atmosphere Shh. totally. It's amazing. And it, it's like there's um, a trumpet call mm -hmm. it's happening for people to come again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I told you before, the, before we started that I had talked to Anna Roundtree today. And she's been doing these incredible prayer meetings. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a synchronicity of time, mm -hmm. you know, that things are starting to line up. It's mm -hmm. exciting. It's fantastic. It is. There's such an expectancy. I mean, I know what the Lord told me and my wife Bryn when I was in. When He told me, and then and then totally confirmed with my wife when we decided to move here, that one of the primary things we were coming here to do was to be a part of this prayer thing that was going to happen here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's an awesome thing. Oh but so, goodness. we're there last year, mm -hmm. and like I said, <laughs> here comes Gary, and I'm ministering that night. Mm -hmm. And you've seemed to show up in my life in these strategic times when God is, like, really doing something so, f like, phenomenal, and it's always like a sign. And um, I remember that night um, that the Lord had killed, told me to give this key away mm -hmm. that was connected with Catherine Kuhlman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not giving that key away. <laughs> and you saw me, I mean, you saw me struggling with that. Yeah. And I remember I gave it to this, this couple, the power of God hit them. And I felt that I felt the release, but I was like, I'm never getting that key back. This mm -hmm. is like an important key. Um, you know, I, I was like, I just wanted to put that key away, you know? And then we meet in the back room, and you say, Charlie, I have something for you. And we hadn't seen each other in four years. Mm -hmm. And you pu pull out of your bag the identical key that I had just given away. The golden key. <laughs> yes. The Lord told me, give your key to Charlie because he just gave his key away. And you just received it. I mean, it was brand new kind of for you a few weeks before or something yeah, yeah. from L.A. And this special golden key, you know, it's so rare. And it, you know, it... I mean, it literally says, do not duplicate on it. Right. 
It's yeah. so it was such an it was such a <laughs> again chronological synchronization, Chronos and Kairos meeting together in that moment. Mm-hmm. It was so phenomenal. We couldn't you couldn't have planned it. No, I left thinking. I came back to my room and I just thought, you could not make this up. It's this too high level prophetic. I mean, it was just so phenomenal and i mean you had no idea that we were there you had no idea that we were going to give uh, that i was going to give that key away we hadn't talked prior none of this stuff and suddenly boom just god sets it up that way and <laughs> something's released you know i had received my golden key four years before um papa bill fowler in in l.a had uh, asked me, said, it's Mother's Day coming up and in that in 14. It was three or four months after Bob passed. I'm in L.A. I meet Papa Bill Fowler. And he said, Gary, you know, um, it's Mother's Day Sunday, and I want to go and honor the mothers of the faith at uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery and these different cemeteries where these precious mothers of the faith are buried. And uh, he would you like to come along? And... I spent a whole day. I mean, it's extraordinary to be with him. He's like a, a this massive father of of history, of the history of the L.A. area. Mm-hmm. Azusa on, you know, yeah. everything. Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, Henrietta Mears. Henrietta Mears has the gospel light mission in 1920, 30, 40. Her, she's, I mean, she's ever, hardly ever been heard of before. And he takes me to these uh, grave sites to honor these mothers. And I learned all this history I'd never known before. And you love revival history. Yeah, yeah. And I Well, mean, you're kind of also, I mean, a revival historian in a sense. Mm-hmm. And I want to get into that as okay. well because you've been go- you go all these different places. Mm-hmm. But go ahead. I'm sorry, Gary. No, it's great. And I, I won't take long, but this is interesting. Henrietta Mears has the gospel light mission. She has this publication coming out. She writes a book, and it's all about Sunday school kids, how important Sunday school is. She, in, in Hollywood, Presbyterian Church, she impacts all of Hollywood, all of L.A. and the southern coast to get people going to Sunday school, kids going to Sunday school. It turns out to be a really big deal. She's not that well-known, but she's a mother in the faith. Mm-hmm. So uh, by the 50s, the 60s, uh, what's amazing, what t- what ends up happening in the 40s and the 50s, 60s in her life is she has this major impact on Billy Graham before he's released into ministry. Wow. He finds her, she's a mother in the faith, and kind of takes him in under her wing before he gets started. And she imparts all this stuff to him. And he, she's absolutely uh, integral in his release. This one woman who just is walking close to God. She's My. this passionate believer. But she's a mother. And she doesn't need to be known. You know? Mm-hmm. She need, but she impacts Jim Rayburn, who had started Young Life. Like, went all around the world. Yeah. And then, here's the story. It's amazing. I'm here with Bill. And he's telling me that Bill and Vinette Bright get married and come live with her for like 10 years. Bill and Vinette Bright, who started Campus Crusade for Christ later, lived with Henrietta Mears for 10 years, the first 10 years of their marriage. They lived with Henrietta Mears. Really? Yeah, 10 years. So she pours into this couple. Mm-hmm. Then they go and release Campus Crusade around the world. There's like 75,000 right. missionaries. Right. So, I mean, all of this, I'm just hard, it's hard to wrap my brain around it. Um, and the key, the golden key, having to do with Catherine Coleman. So, um, you know, within, you know, that week, my next stop is to go to uh, like a retreat in Florida at some lodge that's, you know, it's a group of leaders, intercessory leaders, business leaders, all meeting for three days. Mm. You know, it's just a gathering of uh, times of sharing and prayer. Right. So that's my next stop on my calendar. After L.A. and this Mother's Day time, it, it's so that day impacted my life so much uh, at Catherine Coleman's resting place and Henrietta Mears. I mean, I had so much happened to me. So 
this is the way my life works. It's just amazing. I go to Florida, uh, check in. It's going to start the next day. I get up early the next morning at this lodge. It's all quiet. 6 a.m. I go to have breakfast. I go in the lodge, uh, fellowship hall. There's no one there except the people prepared breakfast. I'm the first one. And I'm, I'm always up early because of prayer. Mm -hmm. So I go get my breakfast, and I just sat down in the chair at this table. I'm all by myself. I haven't hardly started breakfast yet, and there's a hand comes on my shoulder right here. This hand, this gentle hand, just comes on my shoulder, and I look up, and it's this older woman with silver hair. And she said, could I have breakfast with you? And I'm like, absolutely. I stand right to my feet, you know, just out of respect to uh -huh. shake her hand. And I stood to my feet to shake her hand. I just reached out my hand. I said, what's your name? And she goes, I'm Vinette Bright. The week that I'm at Henrietta Mears' wow. grave, okay. I, I had no clue I'm about to meet Vinette Bright, who Bill had just told me the story about her life with my. Bill Bright. I'm serious. This Talk about a divine moment yes. within days. Yes. I'm, now, does I, this always happen to you? Because I know what I know, and I I want to get into um, some other things, but that's the way I've always noticed you in my life mm. is that these divine like synchronizations happen in the spirit, mm -hmm. and God just brings you in the <laughs> right time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, and just... you're always in the right place at the right time, and it's like it's almost like God. Is is created you um, as a times and seasons prophet, but also uh, as a a divine connector, because you're always making these connections. <laughs> so you see her right there. She asks you in the morning, you eat breakfast. Oh my goodness! It's the last thing I ever expect in my life. But it's neat. At the end of that day, honoring the mothers of the faith. At the end of the day. Bill says, I want you to have a golden key. He's the keeper of the key, mm. you know. He gives me a golden key that day in 14. So it was four years later to the month. It, I keep it in my bag. Yeah. And I just happen to have my bag and show up in this, this place you're at ministering yeah. that night. And I'm watching you give your key away. That was so profound, God had given you the key. Right. I mean, that was stunning. And I knew that I knew I happened to show up. Mm. And it's in my bag. I hadn't even the first three years carried it in my bag. It's just months before the Lord said, put your put key, it in, the put bag. The key in your bag. Okay. And there's a spe special little pocket. I know I won't lose it if I put it in this one zipper compartment. And that night when it happened, I'm sitting there staring like he's speaking to me. You know, you need to do this. And I had joy. You know, I just want to do whatever he says. It doesn't yeah. matter. Because, you know, we flow. We just flow. He has us give things away. And the faster we release, but it's challenging times when they're precious, something's precious to us. But um, uh, I call it precious seed. It's, it's precious seed. Something yeah. really precious that right. you, you just sow. You just give it because yes. he prompts us. And it happens to us, but there's a flow. But it was in my bag. So, it's a divine moment I showed up that night. Right, totally. And it was, here's the thing, when uh, Kevin Basconi asked me to come up and speak f uh, for a couple minutes, you know, in the moment, you know, you don't know exactly what you want to say, but you want to bless the people. Mm -hmm. And in the moment when I went to stand up to speak that night, it hit me like a lightning bolt in my own life. May 26, last year, 18 it hit me in the moment i get the mic and stand there holy spirit comes like a wind it was angelic there was a, just a wind on me in a moment i'm gripped what the, the, the clock is streaming backwards and i get it in a moment that it was 40 years before that night that same night may 26 1978 that i was baptized in the holy ghost that same night 40 years before and here i'm in a kairos moment wow. with you man yeah 
That's how incredible. stunning. That's, That's how incredible. stunning. And you hadn't spoke for a like you've been. Mm-hmm. You had been taking a a break. You've been God called you to be hidden. You were mm-hmm. gone. Mm-hmm. I tried to get a hold of you, mm-hmm. couldn't, and suddenly you're in this meeting. Now, what I just realized right now is that you received the key the same year that you gave me the the shepherd's rod. Yeah. It was the same month. I think it it was maybe June in 14. No, maybe May. It came up on a Facebook memory the other day to yeah. me that I saw you and I together. That was it was it was within it was four years that I had, God said give it to Charlie Sham. That's something. Bob that was a totally that that totally oh, I I look at that moment with the shepherd's rod as a moment that God completely shifted my ministry forever. It would never be the same after that moment. That's it was just something so because we were we were obviously doing things for the Lord, but that meeting in Starbucks where I'm take a hold of the shepherd's rod, mm-hmm. I felt like I got electrocuted. Mm-hmm. Transformed me. You know, I have the I, I have it. You know it's coming in Raven Falls now, coming back. <laughs> um but I, I hung it to where every time it's from my living room into my dining room, so every day we have to pass under it. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. You this is really good. Because even that moment, you have to tell the story. What happened, and I didn't know what was happening in your life. You were on your face praying in your son's room. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And you were really crying out to the Lord. He was speaking to you about what was coming, what mm-hmm. he had, what the next shift, something about the next shift. Yeah. And you're visited by an angel. Yeah. And the feathers, the, there's a feather. Right inside in, of in your my hoodie. prayer jacket. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like on the outside. That. So I had this prayer, you know, this this kind of hoodie prayer shirt that I wore, and I'm laying there, and the angel comes and grabs me by the hand, and I'm being electrocuted, and the power of God's all through me. And of course, I've been spending hours in a day in prayer, like really going after the Spirit of God, and. This whole download comes. I walk out and I say to to Brent, I say, I've just been visited by an angel. And she says, well, I know you have. I said, well, why? I do it because I look like it or something. She says, no. And she reaches on my, my hoodie on that side and this pulls this feather out. Wow. And it was like there was no denying that something had happened. Well, then I had called uh, Jeff and he had said, uh, I left him a message, told him to call me back. He calls me back. He says, hey, you just had an angelic visitation. (laughs) We're supposed to commission you on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Saturday, you give me, you you call me, Mm -hmm. and you tell me that unknowing. I didn't know any of this. That this is anything to do with uh, my commissioning or that the angel had visited me or anything, Mm -hmm. and you had just been with Bob, Mm -hmm. and... You were you were you were gonna bring me this rod. Mm-hmm. Talk about that just for a moment, if you can, because I I've never really even I I've almost flown under the radar on that thing. So it was that December day mm-hmm. that Bob is gonna give me the rod. Well, he has two, and he says, "I want you to have one of these rods. This is important. You have this for what the call on your life is ahead. To have this shepherd's rod from me." And I'm going to pray over it and pray over you. And he said, I don't know where the second one's supposed to go. And I'm, I'm with him. We're quiet. And, and it just comes over me. And I said, Bob, it needs to go to a man called Charlie Sham. And Bob said, well, praise God. He said, I'm going to pray over this, this rod for Charlie. And so in the moment, this is what happened. I don't even think I ever told you. I don't know. He lays his hand on your rod, on the shepherd's rod, and he says, the man who carries this will walk in power evangelism. Mm. Powerful. What a word. That's what he said about releasing the rod to you particularly. And that happened in December. 
I didn't come give it to you till May because I'm traveling like all over the world. Right. In the season when you are too, we never had a time to figure out when to get together. Yeah. So somehow I had a prompting that week, call Charlie, there's an urgency, you need to drive over. Yeah. I'm three hours away or something, two and a half hours. Drive to Charlie, get him this rod now. I mean, there was such an urgency and I had no clue what was going on in your life that the angel had visited you. Jeff says to you he, that he feels prompted you're to receive your apostolic commissioning that Sunday, I think. Yeah. And I show up with a shepherd's rod, which totally, I have no, no, no idea. The angel comes, you're about to be commissioned as an apostle. Mm -hmm. And God hands you the rod of authority right interjects it in the moment mm -hmm. without me knowing anything and i'm a messenger that's all yeah i'm just a messenger at the right time i don't know it's it's just the holy spirit man it's precious yeah yeah that's all Ooh, i feel the <laughs> well Anyways. that day when in that starbucks i mean it was so i mean i don't know what everybody else saw it in there but <laughs> When you took hold of that, the lightning took hold of you, you wept. Yeah. You just wept. I mean, it. you just broke in the spirit. It, it wasn't, you know, it was supernatural. You knew it, what was happening to God was coming overshadowing you in this moment in your life. Mm. And I sat there with you, you know, we're just in this holy moment together that's holy and precious. Yeah. That's all. You know, it's powerful. It's sweet. It just—it's always been a relationship that it just the hand of God comes in and out. You yeah. know, it's—it's—it's it's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, now you're moved here. I'm moving here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of promises over this area. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. He's prepared the way. I really Billion believe. Billion soul harvest. Oh my goodness. Fields. Mm -hmm. Full. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this has a this place has a long history of not of not just prayer from the Moravians, mm -hmm. but the Moravians were also missionary evangelists mm -hmm. that were sent out from here. Mm -hmm. Bob got this place totally by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of promises over this region. Mm. It was 1988 that he has this dream. He has a dream, and in the dream, like everything he saw about what was going to happen here, that wasn't even here yet. It's out of one dream that what's all here now, Yeah. 25 plus years later, oh, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's in place. He saw the red roofs of Apple Hill Lodge and where um, the Bazells came and settled. Um, Anna's house above them on Prayer Mountain. It's all what Bob saw before it ever happened. Right. It's, it was everything he laid out. And there's many things that haven't happened yet that he prophesied. So if Bob, I think, you know what, Bob's such a prophet, but if he didn't have that dream, it's like it, it was that intersection in time for Bob to have a dream. Right. That just opened up heaven and birthed what God was going to do here out of My. one dream. My. And now he's a seed that's planted here. Here. Yeah, he's buried. I was there, you know. The memorial service was, was at Morning Star in Charlotte, or Fort Mill. And then we came up here to bury him here. And he's buried at the Gathering Church down the meadow near the woods. Mm -hmm. And um, it was such a beautiful, um, you know, burial uh, service. It, it was incredibly sad um, so many were there together just to gather in honor and uh, in a meadow it's so beautiful you know and he's resting there right here is that seed and yes. he's the one who had the dream and then that's he's there resting in this place of the angels mm -hmm. i mean and and gary do you feel like that that we're entering into another renaissance here in the area that God is calling. Because I feel it, my wife feels it, 
that God is calling the young, the mm-hmm. old, mm-hmm. the hungry, mm-hmm. that something's about to be birthed out of here again. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's about to be a resurgence, mm-hmm. a renaissance of some sort. Mm-hmm. I feel it. I mean, what, what are you, what are you saying? I mean, I talked to a little bit to Anna today, and she felt like, you know, something is happening here. God's yeah. hand-picking people mm-hmm. to come. Mm-hmm. What, what are you sensing? Because, because the reason I'm asking this is because God has used you in these times and seasons. But he's also, a lot of people that know who you are, know, you know your, your stint with television, we'll talk about that all the things you've done with TV, history. Mm-hmm. But God's also used you to go places, redeem lands. Mm-hmm. I mean, all these, all, all this, this whole journey, mm-hmm. really prophetic journey that you've been on your whole life. Mm-hmm. And so God's obviously brought you here mm-hmm. in the area. Mm-hmm. You were living in Tennessee mm-hmm. 25 years. Now he's brought you here. There's a reason that you're here. Mm-hmm. And what, what are you sensing? Wow, I've had expectancy for many years. I began coming here many, many years ago when, with Bob when he'd come up here. There'd be these transformation summits. Don Potter lived here, built this place, and uh, there'd be these active transformation summits up here with Bobby Connor, Larry Randolph, Gary Oates, and Mahesh Shabda, Bonnie, and um, Bob. Bob and Bonnie would come. I mean, through through the years, just everyone streaming through here, mm. and um, there's so many angelic encounters. And what's amazing about it, it's not seeking the angels. We're seeking Jesus Himself. Right. You know, and He said, "Seek first the kingdom." It's Him. It's His person. It's right. the one we love. And I mean, I think He's going to even change our whole perspective of of the angelic. So much of it, we're going to become more intimate. And that he knows each one by name. They have a personality. Mm-hmm. You know, they shine. He loves them like he loves us. They love him and have the mind of Christ. We have all these different encounters and things. And uh, I don't know. This is the place of the angels. The Lord, I, I'll tell you a couple things, Charlie. It's interesting. Last summer I was in this visitation for three or four months, day and night. I mean, I'd never been anything like this. I, I'm used to encounters pretty often, lo- lots of dreams through all the years. Encounters with the Lord personally, going to heavenly places. But I went into a season for three or four months of a dramatic visitation day and night where I'm in both places kind of streaming from heaven. And I'm in this place in between uh, day and night for months. I'm not traveling, I'm not ministering. I'm caught in this place with God. Mm. And in this time, I'm being caught away a lot. I'm having panoramic thing, visions and uh, lots of extraordinary events happening. But one of them was this. I was caught away to the heavens above Moravian Falls. I mean, I'm here, but I'm caught away into a heavenly place above Moravian Falls. And, I'm, you know, you just know, th- you just, in dreams or encounters, where you just know things, you know, yeah. you just, you're flooded, you already know a lot of things yes. that you shouldn't know, you just know yes. what's going on. So I'm in this moment, and I'm in this heavenly place, this massive, beautiful heavenly place above Moravian Falls. Jesus is right here next to me, to my left. I'm at his right. It's just him and I in this heavenly place above Moravian Falls. I'm in white, I have a gold sash, and I'm holding my shepherd's rod. I mean, I'm holding the wow. shepherd's rod okay. in this heavenly places with the Lord himself. And he tells me, this is the portal of the Lord of hosts. And he says this phrase to me. It's not a bunch of portals, a bunch of angels just coming up and down little portals or something. Uh-huh. This is the portal of the Lord of hosts. That's what he calls it. I mean, right. what a thing to tell me. Just give me an understanding of how dramatic it is from the Lord's position right. over this region. Right. right. And Bob had said, you know, it's the second most visited place of the angelic besides, and the whole earth besides Jerusalem. 
Why, you know? For whatever reason, the Lord has determined that this would be the portal of the Lord of Hosts. Wow. Oh my goodness. So you can only, we can only imagine what his plans are that will emanate in this portal. Right. Oh my. Man. And you know, here's the thing. We need to know where we belong, our boundaries, our, the, where he plants us. Mm -hmm. It's really important. We only go and live. I'm in one place in Tennessee on, on a farm for 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. On one place. That's where my, I had all these encounters with God, and I journaled all this. And uh, for 25 years, I mean, I knew I was planted there. And uh, so when he does move us, it's important we know we're being planted by the hand of God and that we don't move just say because we want to. You may want to come to Moravian Falls, but if you are not meant to be here because God doesn't has a different plan for your life, it's important we don't get out of sync and out of time even. We could meant be meant, you, you were always meant to come. Right, but, but it was it, the divine timing. It was the time. They made it, it again, line up. Again, it's time. And people always ask me, they said, was it difficult? They asked me, they've asked me, is it, was it difficult? Mm -hmm. and, and I said, really, the transition was very smooth. It just all fell into place. I didn't try to make it happen. That's so, the best. Yeah. Because then you have peace. Mm -hmm. You know, you know he's in it, and everything comes together, and you're not trying. There's no stress. There's peace. There's challenges of how do we exactly kind of do this. Right. But, you know, and that doesn't have to be about Moravian Falls. It could be anywhere. If he wants us to move us across the states or anything else, we better understand our boundaries. He sets us in, you know, our boundaries in beautiful places, mm. and it's good it's really important where we're established territorially for our influence and authority in whatever realms we have with mm -hmm. the Lord. So, yeah. And I, I always felt, I've, I've been telling people this, um, I started seeing this last year, that 2019 would be a year of transition mm. for many people. And even geographically, they would move. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2018. And I didn't even realize I was speaking to myself, like God was going to cause me to move. And wow. So there are things that God is doing, lining up and and uh, putting people in the in the right places mm -hmm. for what we're about to see in America. Mm -hmm. You feel like America's a, on the verge of a revival and outpouring. I mean, what do you sense with that? Yeah, for a long time, a lot, and even the hiddenness in my life for all these years, forty some years. There's been this establishing this hiddenness of prayer and intercession, but but yes, I believe it's absolutely a lot of my mandate has been about uh, redeeming the time for America, that we would have the time. It would the enemies. He always it says you know in Daniel he wants to change the set times and laws of God. Mm -hmm. He wants to alter God's time, mm -hmm. and it'd be nothing more than his desire for him to rule over America, shut it down. Right. If the we are the light of the world. Right. You know? So that's been what's on me for years is this desperate cry before the throne, God give us time. Mm -hmm. It's been this heart cry, God, give America time. We are not meant to go down anytime soon. You've got a plan for America for the greatest revival. And it's gonna be even beyond what we even know is revival. Can you imagine a billion souls, a billion Something. around the world, right. but especially for the birthing in America. Um, my goodness. So, yes, I absolutely believe it. I, um, I believe we are much closer than we think. Well, I really do. I be, you know, we can, we can be inches away from the line and feel like we've got 17 miles. And I think it's a heartbeat away. I honestly do. And I mean, it it can begin like popcorn, you the know, suddenly out of nowhere. The suddenly, but the popcorn kind of deal going off the, you know, bam, here and there. Mm. But it's going to turn into a, a thunder. It's going to absolutely become a crescendo. Wow! A sweeping, okay. sweeping move. You know, I mean, it sounds so fantastic, but he wants us to see what he sees. You know, if yes. we can come up here and see his panorama, pray his heart, join with what he's doing, the Father's doing, the blueprint, 
pray the blueprint in pray it comes his way his time the sweeping move in power his way so all of this time is preparation he's tearing down demonic strongholds you know he knows precisely as a, as a commander exactly the strategy of how to mobilize his people in the preparation individually corporately oh my goodness yes I, right. I'm so excited Charlie man and and you've done a lot of research on on American history mm. I want you to just talk about that for a minute because <laughs> that was also you know you've been you had been uh, doing this whole thing with America I, I want you to talk about it because <laughs> I don't want to give anything away I just want you to because this is you know the the ways that God has used you is so unique over the years <laughs> I mean hidden but at these strategic times and seasons God gives you these missions mm -hmm. he lines everything up mm -hmm. and you had this whole thing with America that you put together. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Wow. You know, I've always been an intercessor from the beginning. He just put it in me to be a prayer warrior from the start. And um, he laid this foundation through, through all the years just to be an intercession, whether it's praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit, worshiping. it just be praying his heart, that's all. Just God, let your will come. Let your kingdom come. That's right. all. I, I'm so for the kingdom. Everything's the kingdom to establish it. Jesus preached the kingdom. You know, the last 40 days when he came back for 40 days, all he taught was the kingdom. Mm. So um, in the 90s, the late 90s, the Lord began to teach me about communion, the power of the blood, and the power of the intimacy in taking it almost every day that it wouldn't be a regimen, it's not something I have to do, but it's entering into a deeper place of the covenant that I'd never known. And he begins teaching me deep things about, from the word about the blood, ancient things. My life has, has been in patterns that have to do with ancient things, ancient scrolls. My encounters in the mysteries have been with the ancient of days. It's been a very strange journey, like an old prophet you know, uh, and trying to understand even what's happening and walking mm -hmm. out these mm -hmm. mystery realms mm -hmm. with God. So he begins to stir me uh, in the late 90s to begin setting a pattern in my life to go to bed at 10 at night and wake up at 2 every morning. I'd set an alarm and he began stirring this in me with a joy that I would look forward to this. I started it. And it would go on for years and years and years, day and night. Whether it's winter, I'd bundle up. Whether it's rain, whatever. You know, I'm not going to stand out in the rain, but I'm saying I'd be up in the night and I'm out with fields in the country. So I could be out under the stars of the Lord three hours a night. Yes. So that became my life was three hours a night of prayer, intimately, under the stars for the most part. Worshipping, singing, praying in the Spirit, but connecting, engaging and I'd go to sleep at 5 in the morning till 7, two hours. Bob and John Paul used to call that the time of the trances or twilight. So I'd go back to sleep exhausted kind of from 5 in the morning. I'd go right to sleep. Mm. And I'm in the twilight right in between. From 5 to 7. From 5 to 7. I'd have a number of dreams every morning. He'd make up for my fasting That's sleep. That's profound. He would reward me. Because I was so engaged and desiring to be so, with him. So let me stop you there. From 2 until 5, mm -hmm. you would be up praying, mm -hmm. and you'd do communion. Mm -hmm. Then you would go back to bed from mm -hmm. 5 mm -hmm. to 7. Mm -hmm. And you had, and Bob and Paul, John Paul had told you, this is the, the time of the twilight. Mm -hmm. So this is almost like if, if, if you, you, you're going to have a visitation. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing that, and God was started visiting you. Mm -hmm. It's been 20 years or more. Yeah, my life completely dramatically changed within months. I mean, and here's the other factor. He said, I want you to journal all of it. I want you to begin journaling. And I, I found these green journals, the same journals, they still make them. I started out with the first one. They're 300-page journals, by hand, by line, carefully. 
every day for the whole all the journeys uh, all the events all the dreams so you've journaled everything everything for all the prophetic words carefully scribing i've got to, he told me you've got to get this down because it's historic this is going to be historic in your life and in really the church but it's hidden it's intimate but i want you to document what i'm gonna do and it's like I, i'm i'm on it i, I can't I don't, I don't have a good enough memory to track all this stuff uh so i'm on journal 50 of three, wow, 300 my. pages I'm 50. On, I'm on journal 50. Of 300 three. page journals, you're on number 50. 50 is the year is Jubilee. Right. And that's almost 15,000 pages by hand. Yeah. Along with, so I'd track it. So I'd have a way to track everything yes. and have what would be a way to index, a way to uh, capture. Uh, you know, to capture the the, the importance, uh, to to capture uh, the understanding, to capture the deep truths about communion, the blood, the scriptures, the ancient words. You know, I'd carefully research. It says in Proverbs twenty five two, we know this, that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of kings to search it out. Mm -hmm. So it was always the search. It was always the quest, the search. Um, God, I've got to know. You're calling me to go into these places and do these things and be up in the night with you and engage with you. So it began helping me. I have to go to work. I'm, I was a producer in television. I started in television in 76 and within 10 years in 85 and at ABC News in Washington. Yeah, so not like, not like little news. We're talking about... Yeah, I'm at ABC News. ABC with, News with here. Ted Koppel and David Brinkley. Right. Peter get Peter. Ja uh, I can't even think of his name. Peter Jennings. Uh huh. I'm with all these people, and uh, it was just stunning. I mean, through the years, God established me with favor. I started at the bottom, and in ten years, He'd given me such, such favor mm. because he had, he said i want to use you in television yeah. i had a burning to go into ministry and he said i need you in television i don't understand that god would, had planted you there he you follow and he planted you but you also followed god's strategic plan yeah he sent you yeah and that was the trigger i mean you know it was so amazing uh, in that journey he would it was a staircase like anything you get you get favor in the next job you just mm -hmm. want to do your best but what he put in my spirit was a spirit of excellence i wanted to be the very best at whatever he was going to give me to do like daniel i just wanted to be the very best i can be yeah so i'd work hard i'd work extra hours um i'd been in engineering and television uh, i worked 15 years as an editor i was a producer an executive producer supervising producer so it was all for ultimately, it was all, he were used it all together. But ultimately in uh, 1999, um, I'm already working, you know, he has me move from ABC News in Washington and all that to near Knoxville, Tennessee, I'm in Maryville. But in Knoxville in 1994 is where HGTV got started by the, script, scripts. Now did that happen the very year that you moved there? Or? I moved there in 92 from the Beltway. And then within two years, HGTV is going. Now, it had been owned by a production company before that. So I had been getting freelance work from this production company producing shows for A&E. For A&E. And I was producing a show called America's Castles. This amazing, rich documentary back in those days, in the 90s. My. And suddenly, Scripps buys, they own all the newspapers in Cincinnati through 100 years. They buy this production company in Knoxville, and they turn it, it launches HGTV. Just a very tiny thing. And it becomes the fastest growing network in cable television history. The anointing and blessing was on that place, and he put me in the foundation. My. And I just had to follow. What he, he, he'd give me favor. And so I'm doing producing these shows, and um, by... 1999, I do the pilot for a show called Restore America. I mean, they give me a show called Restore America. 
I'm an a, intercessor. An intercessor. And they give me a show called, it's about preservation. But of all things, it's, a, it's called Restore America. Yeah. Which I know prophetically, oh my. What year is this again? In 1999, they wanted... 99, they, they, before the turn of the decade, he, right. God gives you this, sets this thing in your lap, Restore America. Well, he, they wanted to do a pilot. They always, you know, you always wanted to try a pilot to see if this idea is even going to float. Uh -huh. So I did the pilot. Um, well, we had launched to do the first 50 states. I worked with Bob Vila um, to produce the first 50 states of restoring, like he did old, this old house. Yeah. Um, and so by 2000... Man, I got to stop you for a okay. minute, Gary. There is like angelic stuff that is like moving. Mm -hmm. You are listening to this or you're watching this. I usually don't do this, but the whole time we've been doing this, mm -hmm. there has been like this angel that has been moving back and forth. It's just pretty powerful. Go go, go ahead. He, he just keeps moving back and forth, and I keep seeing this like these... This, mm -hmm. I feel Being. lightning. I feel lightning all in me and around me. I I know the presence is so thick and strong right yeah. here while we've been sharing. Yeah. So yeah. This I is really agree. significant what we're talking about tonight. I feel it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's good. I just uh, had to stop you because I keep seeing this. I just want to acknowledge it. I feel it. It's 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 really kind of electrifying. Mm. I feel it as you're sharing it. So, I do the pilot. They decide to move ahead with it. So. On April 18th, 2000, they call me into a meeting. They say, Gary, we want you to become the supervising producer for the whole series. For of a, Restore for, America. Of Restore America. That was, I mean, I know American history. It's one of my favorite things I've ever loved. So I know by American history, I'm in this moment. It's April 18th, 2000, and they're telling me in this big meeting, production meeting, that they want me to take on Restore America completely and do the whole series, cover, be the supervising producer of the whole series, what would be a long-running primetime show, award-winning show. So, but in the moment, I realized this is the 225th anniversary of Paul Revere's ride. On, on that on, date. On April 18th. It was April 18th, 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day in your you know, what uh, Longfellow's famous poem about Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Mm -hmm. So I know April 18th, I didn't know what was going to happen that day. That is the day they give me Restore America. Wow. I'm like, again, it's a time. It's a time it's, in the season. It's a marker. God always releases these markers that are stunning, stunning markers in front of my face. There's no way I could make any of it up. Yeah. So that's how it got started. And uh, so they give me favor. We begin uh, launching the series. We're setting out to crisscross America. Now let me let me uh, ask you this: um, they they had laid out, from what I understand, the places, the series of places that they wanted you to go. Correct? And you uh, had receive this through intercession with some prophetic people previous to that moment so then when they had passed the the script to you to say this is the, the places that we want you to do you already knew well yes exactly but this happened the first year of this that hadn't happened yet okay so i'm producing the show i just know i'm i'm locked in i'm producing a television series i'm up all night long three hours a night i'm still in this mode go to work at seven produce this massive show travel the nation from two S until five you're still, still doing the every prayer night, every night you're going back to bed from five to seven <laughs> you're doing this faithfully yeah wake up at seven go for a 12-hour day 14-hour day my i'm serious in the power of the lord the strength of god i mean the, i loved what i did Talk about deadlines and pressure in television yeah. to produce a series, and it's called delivering shows. You've got to deliver what it's like. They're called flights of thirteen. They want so many shows in the can before they ever air them. They've got to go through a whole series of things with marketing Correct. and yeah. man, it's you, you got deadlines big time to 
make the network happy and right. the scripts and everything else because you're not with. dealing with low budget television we're no. dealing with like the big time boys here we're Mega dealing, millions. yeah yeah so as this is going evolving in 2001 like may of 2001 i receive a prophetic word from one of the most accurate intercessors i know um and uh she's a seer and she calls me one day and says gary i'm having a vision and it's a, like a panel door. There's an American flag on it. And uh, you got to write these names down in your journal. You just got to write all this down right now. And I said, okay, I find out whatever journal I'm on. And she starts listing Mark Twain, Back to the Future, Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, George Washington, a whole long list. I, I just wrote it down. No clue what it means, you know. So I continued to produce this series through the summer, through the next winter in 2001. You know, I'm sending production teams, uh, produce other producers under me, directors all across the nation. And you've got to produce a series, so you may have, uh, this is about historic preservation in the homes, in homes of people and national sites. So in a show, you might have a, something that happened in Seattle something that happened in Texas, something that happened in Boston. Mm -hmm. Well, you gotta be sending crews all over the place and figure out what you're gonna put in each show from each place. I mean, it's a matrix. My, yeah. So he's giving me wisdom on how to do that on the natural level while I'm tracking in the spirit what's happening in whatever Restoring America is. So by 2002, June, they call me in for a meeting they hgtv said we're going to get together with the national trust for historic preservation the major preservation historic place in washington for 50 years on saving historic sites in america mm. we're going to give a million dollars a year away to the national trust to give between to give out to 12 sites a year so they'd have preservation dollars for restoration yeah. to save old places yeah so they had been working for months for 120 sites. They needed both thing, both companies, HGTV and the National Trust, want to narrow down 120 sites down to 12 per year. So they call me in. They slide the paper across the table to me at a conference room. These are the first 12 sites that we've chosen to do, Gary. And I look down at the paper and the first one is Mark Twain's house in Connecticut. The second one is Abraham Lincoln's cottage. It's the list. It's the list. I'm looking at the list. The very list that you had that was already in received. A, a year before, in my journal, my the, this panel door vision lays out where I'm going. A year before, God uses two secular companies to narrow down where I need to go by the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Because God wants you to go there. Because God wants me to go there. He's got a plan. He wants you for, to pray. For me to go pray and intercede. There's something that happened in history that needs redemption. Yeah. At every site. My. And I'm called to go to every place. My. And they give me the list. I get the list from the throne. I know this is... You got this. the list beforehand. And then God all... I mean, God shows it all to you. And then here this secular company slides it across the table and says, you're going to these places. Mm -hmm. And God totally set it up. Mm -hmm. You've been getting up at 2 in the morning till 5 in the morning, mm -hmm. taking communion, mm -hmm. worshiping God, then going back to bed from 5 to 7. Mm -hmm. God's been using you to intercede. And now he's sending you on this mission mm -hmm. and aligning all this stuff mm -hmm. chronologically mm -hmm. and also... To the the Kairos moments of God to each one of these places, mm -hmm. because you're going to be used as an intercessor mm -hmm. to redeem some of these these lands. Mm -hmm. Events in history that took place, specific events, where where something happened in time. The Back to the Future on the second line was the key. I never thought of before. That in that movie, in that film, the principal was Marty. In the beginning of the film, his family is so dysfunctional. It's just all messed up. And 
he meets Doc Brown, who has the DeLorean as the time machine. Right. He realizes he's got to go back in time 30 years to 55 to make it so his parents meet right, to fix something in the past. Right. So when they do, and it ripples forward to the future, he comes back to the future, Mm -hmm. and his whole family's all functional. His dad's a famous author. The whole family's amazing. They turn out to be wealthy. So the principle God put on this prophetic list was back to the future. Go back in time to repair something that was wrong. Repair it with the blood. Repair it with tears and communion. Wow. Go enter in. Find out what took place that went wrong. Hmm. Enter into that place, and I'll give you the power to redeem time, to make it so you can repair that breach, a breach in time, mm-hmm. in the fabric of time. You can actually heal the, the breach in the fabric of time My. so that it sinks the way it needed to. It needed to go. When it the went timing off course. sinks. Mm-hmm. completely and it will ripple forward into the future to make it what it always needed to be whether i understand it or not i just need to go back in time mm-hmm. now, and so you did this all over all 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 over the world i mean all over the united states and, and these were 12 sites the first year the first year it went on now did you do 12 seasons every year i mean 12 episodes every year we had i don't know I mean, we did hundreds of sites ultimately, yeah. but I, I went to all 12 sites every year. The list would come out the second year. It was another list from the throne. So you would get the list every year. I would get year. the list on, on these particular journeys mm-hmm. on, on, on restoring American history at historic sites in those cities every wow. year. Now, I might go to produce a show in a city about some home being fixed, but I knew I had to go to that city on time for something that took place in American history that right. I don't know yet. And I've got to do research. And in the meantime, I have a production manager, I mean, in the group that was a spirit-filled Christian that I could confide in and say, okay, here's what's happening. I mean, how can I tell somebody what God's doing unless they're, they can track with me? Correct. So God sets it up so... There's someone leaving a film department and needs a, needs a position. I need someone to help me to take this show in a master, you know, a big way to help me just with production. But ultimately, they say, I know a bunch of prophets, a bunch of inter- seer intercessors, mm. and they'll help you. I can arrange it so if you want them, I can get you a team of intercessors that are humble that love God with all they are, but they're top-notch intercessor seers that are just love the prophetic realm. And you, we can ask them, do you want to help be a part of whatever God's going to do to help hold up my arms, to help me track sight by sight, week by week, this matrix of where I've got to go and work together to unravel what God's saying and how to define what happened in history, how to, for I'm to hit the target. My. to repair it i need help you know i need intercessory help to find a team of intercessors and i'm an intercessor so we're flowing together we would meet every friday morning for years every friday morning we debrief and spend hours together every friday morning uh like seven of us together every friday morning in a local church under a pastor who understood what was going on who said sure absolutely so we were covered. We had a cover. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So then you went all over the nation, mm-hmm. do it, and you did these sites after mm-hmm. site after site, restoring America. And you would get the list beforehand. Mm-hmm. God would show it to you, and you would be there at the strategic time mm-hmm. to restore history, mm-hmm. because God wanted to do something in America. Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm saying that, and I I know you know this, but and God's continued to do this with you. Mm-hmm. But I want to fast forward to back to 2014, okay. where you're in Bob's hospital room mm-hmm. for another strategic moment where the clock begins to turn. Mm-hmm. And you were there mm-hmm. to record mm-hmm. that moment in history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
so that it wouldn't be it would go in the exact way that God was saying mm -hmm. and God gives the sign that the clock mm -hmm. and the time and all the years that you spent doing that restoring America mm -hmm. and here's this prophet mm -hmm. this man that you served you've walked with mm -hmm. had a vision for a billion soul harvest mm -hmm. and that America would be shaken mm -hmm. with revival. He had seen it, mm -hmm. had had prophetic words about this land, mm -hmm. and here you are and you're filming it, and God's saying the strategic time mm -hmm. that we're not going to miss it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's continuing to do this. He continues to send me on journeys. Even now. Really, in places around the world. I've done it from starting in in 2000 is when I took my first journey. Before the list came, he was sending me to different places in America and around the world, just teaching me and training me, the print training, using trips, things I'd never known or done before. I'd never done this before. Take communion, go to Scotland, and go back to the, the time of the Reformation. There were two cardinals in my family that were named Beaton in Scotland that were archbishops over Scotland that per, per, were the first ones in 1527, 1543 to be burning Protestants at the stake. That, I mean, gripped my heart when I understood the history in my own family. That's wow. what started this for me. After I'd been up all night taking communion, he's saying, go to Scotland at a certain time. This is like in January. I want you in Scotland in April. I want you to go and I need you to go to St. Andrews, where the castle was. There's still ruins there. I want you to go and kneel down on the initials of these guys that were burned at the stake. One was George Wizard. He was a prophet. He was the father of John Knox. So in my own life, I have the curse, kind of, of what would be this family lineage that was corrupt. It was horrible. Mm, right. And I grieved about that. So he's going to send me to Scotland. Now get this, Charlie. This is wild. I'd never done this before. I'm producing the show. And I, I've got to take time off to fly to Scotland to go do a prophetic act. I'm going to take communion. So I don't get a ticket right away. He's telling me, go in April. I'm waiting till April yeah. to kind of get a ticket because I'm still not sure what I'm doing. I feel really, you know, just uncomfortable because I, I, I just felt personally... I don't know if I'm ready, but I want to do what you want, but yeah. help me. Yeah. So here's the deal. One, one uh, day in late March that year in uh, 2000, man, I, I came home from church and I said, Lord, I've got to buy a ticket this today. You know, I've uh -huh. got two weeks and I better buy a ticket now if I'm going to get a, even a halfway decent price. I've got to know now for sure, am I going to Scotland? So... I said this, I'm a dreamer. I can go to sleep in 60 seconds, literally. If I'm gonna take a nap, I can lay down, close my eyes, and in 60 seconds, I'll be gone. I mean, it's just been a pattern in my life. So I know I'm a dreamer, whether it's naps or nighttime when I do sleep. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to Scotland, I need you to give me a dream right now, this afternoon when I take a nap right now. I need to know whether you want me to go to Scotland. And that's all I did. It was the biggest fleece I'd ever laid out. I said, I need a dream right now. If you want me to go, I will book my ticket today. Yeah. So I go to sleep. And in the dream, I go back in time to 1543. I'm in Scotland in 1543 back in time. I'm literally in the house, and I, I'm in this house of a gal named Heather Beaton in 1543 in Scotland. I'm in, their, in her house, and I know I'm from the future. I'm back in time. Literally, it was taken back in time. I'm in the living room, whatever, with a fireplace, hearth. She walks in the door with her brother, and she's stunned I'm standing in her, her, her home. <laughs> she's just stunned I'm standing in her home. And she said, what are you doing in my house? She was upset. And I know her name's Heather Beaton. And I know somehow distantly we're related. But I have no clue what to tell her. I'm uh, on the spot. 
what are you doing here? And all I could think of was telling her, I'm from the future. I told her, I'm from the future, the Lord sent me. That's all I knew to tell her. I'm from the future and the Lord sent me. Well, if you're from the, from the future and the Lord sent you, then you're going to tell me what's in my, the margin of my Tyndall Bible. I'm like, talk about on the spot. Yeah. She goes across the room and gets her Tyndall Bible. I don't know anything about the Tyndall Bible in 1543. And she opens her Bible, her Tyndall Bible. And she's got words written in her margin. I'm across the room. I'm supposed to have a word of knowledge about what she's got in this encounter. I close my eyes. I, the words begin forming in front of my eyes, and I'm about to tell her what it is, and I wake up. I wake up in this moment. I was back in time. I'm going to Scotland. Wow. And I book my ticket. I book my ticket to Scotland because he took me literally back in time in an encounter. It was stunning. In the moment I needed it, wow. he so sovereignly proved to me that somehow he could literally transport me through time. I mean, we can be trans relocated or go to heaven. We, you know, we've encountered many different things. But he taught me he could begin to do this even by his own hand. My. Not just go back practically in history to redeem something. But actually really go back. So he be literally began taking me back in time. He took me back. It confirmed I'd go to Scotland, and I did, and it was stunning. But even in the journeys, I had to do Lincoln's Cottage in Washington, D.C., where Lincoln would summer. He, I'm going to do Lincoln's Cottage, you know, to be part of Restore America. I have a dream. I'm taken back in time and to, to Lincoln's Cottage in the summer of 1862. I'm in, at Lincoln's Cottage during the Civil War with Lincoln at Lincoln Cottage, at Lincoln's Cottage. My. I'm walking, I spend the afternoon with Abraham Lincoln. I mean, stunning. We're walking and talking. He's in his long black outfit. His, his... Now, was this during the times where you would get up from 2 to th two to 5 <laughs> and then you would go back to sleep and then that would, yeah. these encounters would happen during that, that yeah. 5 to 7? Yeah, generally it would be from 5 to 7 during the, but Bob called the time of the trances. He, time of the trances. He called it the time of the trances. John Paul, called, John Paul called it the twilight, the time of the twilight. So I'm telling were, you, if anybody's listening to this right now, <laughs> bunch of millennial, <laughs> Holy Ghost filled people, they're going to be getting up. We're going to have like a whole <laughs> slew of people getting up now from two, from, from two in the morning until five, and then going back to sleep. This is amazing. So, so. You're getting the, let me draw this back in. You're getting the list. Mm -hmm. Prophetically, they're giving you the list. Mm -hmm. But then you're starting to not only just go there in the natural and redeem it, God's starting to actually take you back. He in, literally is taking me back. So before I ever literally take a production crew to Lincoln's Cottage, he, take, he gives me a dream between the 5 and 7 in the morning where in the dream it's a vehicle to take you back in time, to literally take you by his hand, literally. So you're back in time in that moment in 1862 with wow. Lincoln. I, so you were actually having these encounters where you were like in a transportation device. Yes. And you were getting taken back. Yes. Like a chariot. Like a chariot. And I'm, I'm suddenly in 1862 in one afternoon, on a July afternoon with Abraham Lincoln. And... Um, this is fascinating. I mean... Really, you know, I had conversations with him, and I remember the conversations. We were having conversations. My, what I was trying to share with him was that he was in danger. He was, his life was in danger. I shared with him he was going to be assassinated, you know, and I was trying to warn him he didn't have enough security. I, I, I mean, I just understood it. We talked about uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1859, 1860, how he got into office. I, I mean, I just remember all these things we talked about. I can remember his voice. There's no recordings of his voice, but I, I can you hear his voice. You vividly remember his voice. Oh, my goodness. I know Abraham Lincoln's voice, and yet I, I don't have a way to capture with a camera and audio what I know has taken place, and right. I'm in those moments. But I was with Abraham Lincoln for an afternoon. We walked and talked. We sat on a bench. 
there were very few soldiers around, Union soldiers at that time, even at, at Lincoln's Cottage. Here the war's going on. He rides his horse to the White House a few miles every day from Lincoln's Cottage he, during the Civil War. Wow. He even had his hat shot off one time. It's in history. So I was warn, trying to warn him about what was going to take place in his life. And, uh, I mean, I was gripped. I'm just gripped. I'm in these moments that I can try to make an appeal to him. Please listen to me. Please hear me. You've got to have more protection. Mm. You've got to really beef this up. I mean, that was the purpose of my being there. But there were things he told me, and I can't remember. Really? He, there were things he told me that I literally can't remember what he told me. Wow. It was, God can conceal it because you're not meant to. For it can, he can conceal things because it's like that, in that envelope that's hidden and it's not meant to be open for a time, you know. Maybe yeah. one day it'll it'll, it'll, unfold. it'll unfold. But I wasn't meant to remember, and it's okay. But I had done what I was supposed to do in the moment I had with him one afternoon. So later on, I actually am, I found a book about, and I'm reading about Lincoln. And I've, I've, I come upon these pages of Lincoln in 1862, the mm. summer of 1862. I'm reading about July of 1862 with Lincoln. And that, that his cabinet had come, and he was form and talking to his cabinet about writing the Emancipation Proclamation. That he was going to write, a, he wrote a draft then in July. In September, he wrote it out. It came into law in 1863. Wow. He wrote the Emancipation Proclamation at that cottage, at My. that summer home. So, but in the book I'm reading, it says in, a, in July of 1862, certain men came to Lincoln to warn him that he didn't have enough security. That was the sentence. That set it off, that, knew, that you knew. I was one of those men. I'm reading that there were men sent to Lincoln in 1862 that in July. That is incredible. I'm freaking out. I am absolutely freaking out that I'm reading that I was one of those people that went to warn Abraham Lincoln. Really? Wow. So ultimately, I go to Lincoln's cottage to produce it, to produce this show for the series. Every site had something different. So what was it about Lincoln's cottage that I needed to know to repair in time? So basically... It would always be a research deal, and I wouldn't sometimes know until I get there. He will give you maybe 70% of what you need to know, mm -hmm. but he will always hold back something. So you have to go by faith, and he'll give you the last keys when you need them. It's this strange journey, but on these intercessory, strange prophetic journeys, you don't always just get the whole map. You will get some sort of direction and purpose and timing. But you've got to actually get your feet on the ground at the right time. Yeah. And he will always, if, you, if you're doing it with, you never go do anything unless he's doing it. You can never go think you're going to go do any assignments that you think you're going to fix something or do something for God with communion. We can never take communion in some strange way or without it being holy. I mean, I right. did these things, you know. So, so you were totally led by God's divine plan. Right. See, I, I, I love this whole conversation that we're having because you started out just wanting to see God mm -hmm. from 2 until 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing just opens for you. Mm -hmm. And you were going to these sites in the natural, and then suddenly God starts taking you. Mm -hmm translating you back in time mm -hmm. and, and, and you're seeing yourself in history mm -hmm. and you know that's me I was there I, it, this is incredible this is incredible uh, Gary um, I want to know if you'll pray for people that are watching or listening um, mm -hmm. you're an intercessor a prophet and God has used you to transport, to see the fabric of time change, rearrange. There's been some incredible things that you've done. Will you pray for people? Because there's some people that are are like you. Because you keep saying I'm a hidden one. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. There, are, there are.
people that are around the world that are going to listen to this or watch this that are those hidden ones mm -hmm. that come out during those strategic times. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like um, what Isaiah said in Isaiah 8.18. He said, my children are for signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. Some of God's children are signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. They're literally a sign and a wonder. You're a sign and a wonder, Gary. And there are those that are listening to this, and God's going to use in that way, mm -hmm. like a, you're a forerunner for mm -hmm. a generation that's about to, that is coming on the scene right now. Mm -hmm. That they're listening to the stories that you're saying, right, and they're and they're having faith mm -hmm. to be able to step into that. Will you pray for people? Absolutely. Praise God. Yeah. I'd be blessed. Thank you, Charlie. Wow. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just praise you. It's such a joy and an honor to come before your throne. You said, come boldly before my throne where you can obtain mercy, find grace to help in a time of need. I thank you, Father, that you willingly give us instruction. You sent Gabriel to Daniel in Daniel 9. And Gabriel told him, I've been sent to give you insight and understanding. Because Daniel was repenting for Israel and he needed to hear direct instructions from the Lord. Father, we're here to do your will, and I praise you for all those listening, for all those watching uh, through time as this is played over and over and over, God. Yes. I thank you, Father, for every life that's watching this. I thank you for the anointing. I release the blessing. I release the prophetic blessing, the Father's blessing, the anointing, the impartation of Almighty God through Jesus Christ raised from the dead. I honor the blood of the Lamb. I thank you, Jesus, we're here sovereignly by your hand for such a time as this. God, I thank you for raising up leaders, raising up intercessors, raising up chosen ones, those who have the heart of God, those who follow the Lamb that conquered to receive the inheritance, that he might receive the inheritance mm -hmm. due his name, this harvest for laying down his life, that the masses, the masses would come to Christ and he would receive his just reward. Yes. I thank you, Jesus, that you would release right now, O oh God, an awakening. I pray you yes. release the awakening of fire, the desire for the mysteries, the desires for, the, for seeking you, the purpose of seeking you. Moses said, show me your ways, show me your face. The, the revealing, the passionate cry, Jesus, reveal yourself to me. Jesus, I've got to know you. I want to know you. I want to, to, to just seek your face. I want to bow down, kiss your feet. I want to kneel at the cross. I want to fulfill my destiny. God, I thank you for Psalm 139, 16. I thank you, God, that every day of our lives were written beforehand in a scroll. There are destiny scrolls. God, I release the blessing, the anointing, that everyone watching God would begin to have encounters, would begin to have encounters, engaging with heaven, yes. engaging yes. with your throne, engaging with the angelic yes. to fulfill your will. In Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, the great cloud is speaking that they all didn't receive their promises, but us with them will all receive our promises together. It is the Mahanaim dance. I thank you. It's the great cloud working with the body of Christ in the earth, mm. with the angelic realm to bridge the two, mm. that we would walk out these in these fiery places and the mysteries, seeking God under the stars, yes. seeking God in the ancient paths, uh, and seeking literally to walk in the realms of the ancient of days. God, I release the unlocking of time, the unlocking of the kairos of God, the eternal realms, I, un I just thank you, God, that I am a doorkeeper in the house of God to unlock a, a, a one who holds the keys for eternity. That you, God, I release the unlocking, the opening. I thank you for the opening of time. That those who have, you have chosen to be the keeper of the keys, that they would, be re uh, they would receive the instructions. Everyone listening. Who everyone has a destiny, mm. God, a prophetic destiny. You know what every one of us need and the desire that we would fulfill the mandate of what you've called for us to do, yes. each one of us. And we've all got different roles, 
But God, what you want to release tonight in the unlocking of understanding of the mysteries, the unlocking of the ancient past, the unlocking, O oh God, of the mind of Christ, I release the blessing of the mind of Christ into everyone listening, that they'd be partakers, they'd be partakers of the covenant that Christ bought yes. and with his own blood, that they would arise. You said in your word, to arise, shine. You said, Father, in Daniel 12, uh, you said this, that many would go to and fro. In the last days, many will go to and fro, and knowledge will increase. And I thank you, Lord, that to and fro means to arise. I thank you what it means in our day, prophetically, that many will go arise to and fro to the heavenly realms, to the third heaven. They would bring back the knowledge of the glory. I thank you, Jesus, that it's your desire. You said in, the knowledge would increase. Yes, knowledge is increasing in the earth, but you would desire that the knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of the heavenly councils, the mm. knowledge of the glory would begin flooding and streaming into the earth that the kingdom of God would come. I release God the joy, the burning desire for Christ, the burning desire to know you face to face, to walk, O oh God, uh, in the, those holy places of the yes. lampstand, the seven spirits of God. I thank you, Jesus, for that crowning light, the release of your light to guide every one of us now. God, you have desires. You have so many interesting things. God, you want to release the brilliance of the mind of Christ into your faithful believers. So I thank you, Jesus, for releasing the brilliance of Christ into each one who's thirsting, who's passionate to know you. Yes. I thank you, Jesus, for the arising of your love upon every believer, the Father's love, the Father's blessing. And I release that as a Father, God. I thank you. I release... This is the word of the of revival in America, yes. revival in the nations. I release the keys. I, we call it into being right now, as we call the future into now. What you have said, what you've desired in the great harvest, that it come now. You said the laborers are few, but your God, you've got harvesting angels to help us. I thank you for the rising up, for the Kairos time to meet the Kronos, that right now, God, you'd set in motion destiny mm -hmm. in the life of every believer listening right now. Mm -hmm. You'd release them into their destiny right now, where, uh, God, you release a breaker right now, where they've been, they've been waiting patiently, or they haven't known which way to go, what to do. What is it? What is it, God, that you release the joy and the unlocking in the life of every believer who's listening, desiring to do your will? that they will not miss their destiny in the time of this harvest, God. I thank you for the angelic host and the coordinating of heaven and earth. Uh, and you're calling God that the bride make herself ready right now. So I thank you, God. There's even um, just uh, a group of angel call, angels called bridal angels mm -hmm. that come and release bridal garments. I thank you, Jesus, for the workings of heaven and earth right now yes. to do and, uh, and fulfill your desire from your throne, yes. O oh God, in every way. Thank you that you're planting Charlie and Bryn here. I thank you that you're making a way to establish, firmly establish your encampment of heaven in Moravian Falls, yes. God, for the, the planting of the Lord to do your will, that the, this portal of the Lord of hosts that's open here, O oh God, that you begin releasing uh, your desire in a greater way than ever and release this flood of light and glory across America. The drawing, the drawing uh, out of the well, uh, a thirst in people to find Christ right now. You'd release that anointing. And I thank you, Jesus, for unlocking the understanding of the blood, the covenant. I thank you, Jesus, for sealing these things up. There's far more. But God, do your will right now. And those thirsting to find it would, would find the supremacy of Christ in their life. And they would begin as they seek you and set out these times of days and night that their, life, their lives would become electrifying, 
that everything would begin to lock in order and they begin to function and flow with Holy Spirit in the impossible. I thank you, Jesus. Nothing's impossible if we believe. So have your way right now. Change us. Transform us every day. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us to carry our cross every day, to be true believers, mm -hmm. that we would be pure, that we'd have integrity, that we'd walk in righteousness, that we'd be preachers of righteousness, that we, we would pursue you day and night with all of our hearts, that we would be the living lampstands we need to be in this hour, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wow. Gary, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, Charlie, this it's a has blessing. been a joy. It was a great. <laughs>